So you guys like to smoke weed, right? I just wanna get high. Pass me the crowning. See, I just wanna get high. Pass me the crowning. Now I just wanna get high. Pass me the crowning. I just wanna get high. Pass me the crowning. Yo, now I just wanna get high. Are you guys having a good time? Are you still alive out there since it's post 420? No? Well good, that means you're high and we like to hear that. How many of you guys love hash? Yeah! I love hash too, as she said. Wanna hit the blunt? Yeah. Do you wanna hit the gas? Yeah. Hit the blunt, man. Hit the blunt one more time, yo. Hit the blunt one more time. Yeah. Hey, 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 oh no, that's enough, baby. That's enough, that's enough. He about to spare that look. He already he crying. <laughs> 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 Hey, as president, we are all gonna get high. 24-7. Yeah, we're gonna start. 24-7. 420. No Who wanna be high? President, high. I used to love when I would travel to other states, other countries, things like that, and people would ask you where you're from, and you would say, oh, I'm from Colorado. And they would say, oh, the mountains, the snow, the skiing, that's so beautiful. And I would say, yes, it is. And now anywhere I go, you say you're from Colorado, and they say, oh, that weed, how's that going for you? When I grew up here, Pueblo was on all those top lists as one of the best places to raise a family in the country. But it was now just included as one of the top worst cities to live in in America. It's sad to watch uh, this, my state become known as the drug state. The most concerning age group is going to be this one that's growing up right now and once they become teenagers and they've only known this legalization era and it's, it's fed to them like it's normal, it's no big deal, it's nothing. Um, and it's a huge deal. And the research we're just starting to understand as far as how this marijuana irreparably impacts the youth brains, um, that's scary. They can lose IQ points that they will never get back. Um, and one of the biggest concerns is that this high potency marijuana that is now created, we have nothing to compare it to from the past. Uh, so all the people that say, you know, they grew up during Woodstock, they did it in high school or college and had no big consequences, this is a whole different animal. It's not that you're talking about a slightly higher THC. You're talking about something that's not double, not triple. You're talking about some, a 10 and sometimes 20 fold increase in potency. It is genetically modified and grown specifically for potency and they've changed the whole dynamic of these plants. When I was a kid it was not a big deal because it was only 2 to 3 percent THC and then in the late 80s early 90s it rose to about 5 to 7 percent. In about 2001, 2002 here we saw it right around 10, 11 percent. In Europe, THC content over 16% is considered a hard drug. This is realistically a new drug. This is not, you know, we call it marijuana, and yes, it comes from the same plant, but this is not the plant you're thinking of when you're thinking of marijuana. He said very proudly, I just had a product test out at like 30 to 33% in natural grown plant. And I'm telling you, five years ago, I was told by the marijuana industry, that's impossible. A lot of that you've seen move um, from THC actual to uh, THCA, which is a uh, tetrahydrocannabolic acid. And theoretically, that's once it decarboxylates, you put flame to it or you touch it to a heated nail, that's what uh, releases that carbon molecule and becomes THC. Genetic modification is doing wonders. Then we extract it, um, superheat it, and we literally have what is referred to as the crack of marijuana. You can get the marijuana concentrates, the wax, the dabs, the shatter, the BHO, the butane honey oil, and it's up to 98, 99% THC. And that is just a very dangerous drug. The dabbing's been around for a while, but all of a sudden, super um, high concentrated 
forms of marijuana resin, marijuana oils, that also coincided with vaporizers, also become really popular. So now it wasn't just that uh, they had to have a pipe and uh, green leafy marijuana that was really strong smell, but they could carry around a little circle thing that had 200, 300 dabs of 95 to 100% THC. They'd go to the bathroom, they'd heat up the glass, dab it in oil, take a hit, and head back to class. Almost zero, zero orders. What it, what it caused is levels of people getting caught with it to go down, which makes it look like we're actually decreasing the amount of people using marijuana when it's not the case. It's just significantly harder to detect. To a state that's considering it or a community that's considering it, um, I would tell them get the facts. One of the biggest drivers for all of these states uh, is the money. Uh, unfortunately, it's greed. Right? It's, uh, it's, it's really good people in leadership positions that are trying to do the best for their community. And they see this as a resource or a revenue generator that's going to help them better their community. And the fact of the matter is, if they really study those communities that have it, um, they will realize that there's not a whole lot of money. And the money that does come ends up being put back into the industry, either in the form of rehabbing your children who get hooked on it, or your adults that get hooked on it, or your, you know, the increase in your law enforcement resources that you're going to have to have um, in your homeless population, in your hospitals, in your, in your infrastructure, right? There's no money. Um, and I think that's the, probably the biggest fallacy. Last year, between recreational and medical marijuana, you know, the state sold over 1.3 billion worth of dollars of marijuana. What would the state get? 157 million. Everyone was really sold on the fact that it's going to create commerce and jobs and um, actually boost up the town's economy. This was brought to us by outside interest, outside funding. They wrote it, they collected signatures on college campuses, and they sold. A, a brilliant marketing campaign to voters who expected something completely different. The only people I think that are making money off of this are the people in the industry. There have been some politicians and legislators that have benefited, but the average citizen and the people living across the street from you have not. The state of Illinois is looking at, we just want to solve our budget crisis, so we need the tax money to solve our budget crisis and we'll be good. Guess what? Colorado just went into special session to figure out the budget crisis five years in hasn't fixed or solved anything. None of the promises that were made ring true. The industry said, if you legalize it, you can keep it out of the hands of youths. Uh, that has not been the case. It's a community issue, it's a national issue, and our children are hurting, and they're being literally, it's like the Pied Piper, they're being led astray right under our noses. And I think it's important to put a face to it, I think it's important to tell the truth, I think it's important to, um, to put it out there and be transparent and say, you know, let's talk about this. And, and so that's my hope. If you say yes to legalization of marijuana, then you say yes to more and future users, and those users are the youth of your community. The industry can't survive unless you create more users. Oh, if you legalize it, we can regulate it. That'll get rid of the black market, and also we'll never get into the hands of kids. Well, I've had kids tell me, you can walk right into some of these marijuana dispensaries, and especially the medical dispensaries that are not regulated by the state, and they get whatever they want out of the back door. I promise you that the kids are using it. They're telling us in the emergency department that they're using it readily. We are 55% higher than the national average currently. Colorado's still number one in the nation for youth 12 to 17 years old, which we had never been before legalization occurred. Anytime you increase accessibility, availability of any substance, um, and then they've convinced, and the data proves this out, they've convinced the youth that it's safer than alcohol, that it's not harmful. I hear all the time, oh, but it's not heroin and people, no one's dying from pot. I'm like, really? That's the only option we have for our kids? It's heroin or pot? How about a drug-free childhood and so kids develop their brains normally? The other kids that get it going, why would an adult ever do this to us? Why can't we change the law?
I always say the marijuana industry is selling addiction for profit and our kids really get suckered into that and they don't understand they're being preyed upon by a massive industry. This is a multi-billion dollar industry. And I, I feel really passionate about, you know, pulling the curtain back on that. And it's a hard battle to fight as a parent when you have people much bigger saying it's not a big deal. The marijuana industry is really good at, it's just like the tobacco industry and the alcohol industry is, is really good at marketing their product. And they're like, we don't market it to the youth. I'm like, oh yeah, that's why you have Jolly Rancher edibles. Why else would you make candy bars and, and cookies and all the things that we identify with our youth infused with, with marijuana? It comes down to greed. People do not care about other people get medicine or recreational marijuana, they care about money. For them, it's money. They don't, I mean, they don't care. And, and that was the discussions we would have with my son is, you think they're gonna be at your funeral if something happens? You know, if something were to happen to you, will, will they be there? You know, and... Were they at your son's funeral? Uh, no. Everyone can say that it doesn't matter what laws are in place as long as people are, you know, doing it to themselves or not impacting others. But once it's starting to hit, you know, our roadways and things like that, that impacts all of us. When I go now and I ask them, how many of your friends think it's safer to drive with marijuana than alcohol? All the hands go up. And I don't care if I'm talking to freshmen, juniors, seniors, sophomore, whatever they are, hands go up. When I see those numbers increasing and the number of drivers that were positive for marijuana involved in these traffic fatalities increased 66% just since legalization occurred in Colorado, that's definitely something of note that I, that I pay attention to. Our law enforcement officers are completely overwhelmed. I was speaking last Friday to our district attorney and he said the only thing that legal pot has brought Colorado Springs is homicide. And he told me of case after case after case that he has worked on lately where it's a homicide case and individuals were killed because of fights over pot. Um, and it's legal. Doctors and ERs can tell you the true impact of how they're just overwhelmed with it. Talk to any of our EMTs or EMS, um, they're just inundated with the calls. They're told not to speak out or they're going to lose their job. I don't have a thing to gain by speaking out. The popular thing right now is to say marijuana is not harmless and we should legalize it. That's going to do nothing but help people. But that flies in the face of the evidence that we have right now, whether from a medical standpoint or a social legal standpoint. Um, it is not going to be this panacea of cure-all that is being advertised uh, across the country and really across the world right now. But you're only going to get these people to agree about marijuana as medicine. You're only going to get these people to agree about marijuana as medicine. The coalition of senior citizens, of housewives, and professionals, and doctors, and lawyers, and nurses. Mm -hmm. You know, politics is illusions. Right. Shadows on the wall. Uh, it's pictures, it's, it's photos, it's an AP wire. Right. And uh, so I've not created an illusion, but I've articulated what marijuana, I've changed the face from a long hair hippie to Hazel Rogers. Do it for three and a half years and uh, get away with it. <laughs> As there's no other substance that you can do recreationally, that is also a medicine. If it's a medicine, it's a medicine and it needs to be taken over and handled by pharmacies like a medicine. Um, where you get a prescription, you go to a pharmacy, they give you a pill and prescribe doses and they do those things. If it's recreational, it's recreational. But you're sending a really poor message to kids that it's really good for them because it's a medicine that they can use recreationally. And that's confusing. Part of the problem, the industry uses the word cannabis or marijuana interchangeably. So they talk about how wonderful cannabis is, it's so healthy. And the healthy part they're talking about is CBD. They're not talking about THC. So CBD, which is non-psychoactive, there are some studies showing there is some benefit. Um, still, it's pretty anecdotal. There are not really good, well-designed, long-term studies on any of these things for anything. For those legislators who are considering allowing CBD oil for children with seizures, 
there is so much that's missing in that narrative. And let me just start by saying, there are products that are undergoing clinical trials with GW Pharmaceuticals in the US um, to gain FDA approval for a pharmaceutical grade product that would withstand clinical trials. What we currently are doing in Colorado is not that. They are again artisanal products made by individuals who are not doctors, who are not pharmacists, who are not toxicologists. They're people who are in the marijuana industry. So I think the jury is still out. My guess is that we'll further be able to define a specific subset of patients for whom it's beneficial. Um, but there's likely another subset who's probably gonna be made worse. If you look at Children's Hospital Colorado website on how effective are cannabis-based products for seizures, they are showing still that EKGs are not showing a reduction in seizures like we're hearing publicized. Some children respond to it, some children don't. This seizure disorder, Gervais syndrome, um, Kids have a tendency, their brain routes around whatever medication they're taking, so it's effective for a little while and then not. I think some people truly believe that it's going to help them. Um, and this is what the industry does. They go into the marijuana shops and the marijuana shop employee is telling them to stop their medications and giving them the THC. And they come in with a little paper that says how much they should use and how often they should use it. It looks an awful lot like a prescription and that they were told to stop taking their other medications. What I see that's scarier to me is parents self-medicating their, their kids with ADHD and ADD. Because it decreases those things, they give their kids marijuana. With PTSD, there isn't any research out there that shows it's beneficial. We would have people come in treating their diabetes with marijuana, treating just you name it, people were treating it with marijuana and stopping their normal medications until they wound up in the emergency department to see us. We were testing on human subjects and just making these decisions on the fly. Really, science should drive this. Um, this is a health and safety issue. It is not a political issue. Even at the risk of people giving me death threats, um, people telling me that, that I just was uninformed or hadn't read the literature, I spend the majority of my time doing this and it's because I care about my patients. If you want to talk about cancer, there has been shown to be some studies that show it might have some anti-inflammatory or anti-tumor properties, but those are only in vitro studies. There's nothing in vivo that shows a benefit. It's so much so that the FDA recently came out and asked companies to stop advertising that because there's no literature to support that at all. And they've, they've told them that they're no longer allowed to advertise something for which there's no actual research in. What I want to get across, cigarettes affect your lungs, that's it in general. Alcohol affects your liver, as far as most people know, marijuana affects your brain. Changes the frontal lobe, drops the IQ, by an average to six to eight points, even in adults, and it does not return to normal. And there is a direct link between marijuana and mental illness, especially if you're predisposed, because we know that marijuana turns on the gene that carries mental illness, it's a comp gene. The younger you start use, and the more uh, frequent you use it and the higher potency that you use, the more likely you are to start exhibiting psychosis. So what are we going to do? Like, Ten years down the road, we're going to have a lot more schizophrenics. I mean, that just doesn't make any sense. I started to notice how it affected me. Kids will dab out, meaning they hit the high-end marijuana, and uh, they black out and they wake up three to four minutes later, they can't remember anything, they become extremely anxious, then they're terrified, then they become psychotic. The common people would say that's somebody who's going crazy. That's what would be the common term for psychosis. But to put this into picture, this is somebody who the police are bringing in, they're screaming uncontrollably, usually about some sort of active hallucination they're having. Um, they're requiring four-point restraints, meaning they've got to be strapped down to the bed. Um, they're spitting at you, they're screaming that somebody's coming to get them, that God has commanded them to do something. All of these just clear active hallucinations that, it, that would go with psychosis. They're clearly paranoid um, and they're clearly not in their right state of mind. And so that's kind of what we're seeing on street corners and in parks and things and people are kind of out of touch with reality. We see that probably close to every other day in the emergency department that somebody's coming in with that degree of psychosis. Um, and the only thing found positive in a majority of their, their urine drug screens is cannabis. I mean, I understand that it's difficult to make it in America today, it really is, but it's certainly even more difficult when 
when you're, you have an addiction and people are addicted to pot. I mean, I see it. Um, and I don't see how people think that that can't happen. The great lie of the marijuana industry is that marijuana is not addictive. Marijuana is absolutely addictive. Um, you know, it always takes me back to the, the old cigarette commercials that my dad used to joke about. I have an old adage, you know, the first one's free and I have a customer for life. Once THC got over 5%, that's when we saw the very first marijuana dependent syndrome diagnoses. It's actually in the DSM-5. People will say it's not addictive. And the medical industry doesn't respond to that much because they're like, it's in the DSM-5. Of course it's addictive, we know that it is. What they're doing with the money, if you really follow the money in Colorado, you know, they're utilizing a lot of the money for drug rehab programs. So we're just perpetuating this. So we legalize marijuana and then we we take our tax dollars that we're making off of marijuana to set up rehab facilities to get people off marijuana. It's like a gerbil wheel. One of the things I think that was most shocking to a lot of people in Colorado was this huge growth in the homeless population. After legalization, we also saw this group that we more refer to as this transients or travelers. We now refer to them as marijuana immigrants. Um, some like the term and claim it, some don't. But you will ask people um, what brought you to Colorado because they go straight to social services to get food stamps and get medical and all that. And um, they say, I came here to smoke pot. There's no shame in it because it's legal here. So they're very proud of it and feel like they're a part of something awesome and wonderful. And honestly, we just don't have enough housing for people. Um, the people who are kind of at the bottom of the barrel in terms of resources now have even less. And it's just a very different group that's come in, very entitled, very difficult to work with. We've had to actually closed down our supportive service center because I couldn't keep my staff safe anymore. And that just really breaks my heart. There's been about a 100 time increase in the amount of transients that were here. And they didn't have resources, they didn't have family, they didn't have support, but they came to either smoke weed, grow weed, or just be able to use it. They were here to use legal marijuana and they had no intention of getting a job. Our motels in Pueblo are, are full. So you can't even use motels for emergency shelter because people are utilizing those for permanent housing year-round. So you have kids that are living with parents that smoke a lot of pot in very small spaces. So it's changed what we've been able to do for the people who need us the most. We point out in our report that all crime in the state of Colorado, when you're comparing the four years prior to legalization to the four years after, the four years prior, uh, violent crime increased about 1.2%, and after, it increased by about 20%. We really have this criminal element in the community that's, that we didn't have before. It's not just about marijuana. It has very little to do with the actual smoking of a plant. There's so much more that comes with it, with legalization, that most people don't ever um, contemplate. And when you have somebody who is coming off a high and they need money and they're desperate and they don't have anything, if you think you won't get mugged, you're crazy. We had to have Cherry Creek Trail. There is needle dispensaries on our running trails because people were stepping on heroin needles. Four cars a day are stolen in Pueblo. And it doesn't matter if your vehicle is locked, uh, they will come in, they will jump in when you're sitting at the convenience store. If somebody runs in, you have to lock your doors because somebody will jump in next to you and carjack the vehicle. The black market itself is here and, and, and thriving because basically what they're doing is they're hiding in plain sight. If you're going to control, tax and regulate a substance, you don't do two things to control it. Number one, you don't simultaneously allow home growth the home grow becomes the black market. Because if you want people to go to a regulated location and use their ID and purchase and contribute to the tax coffers, you totally undercut that whole system by allowing home grow. So we have a community that has invited the industry here through their leadership. Um, and so black market people from outside the state have come here to set up shop and grow marijuana. Uh, whether it be legally or illegally, for the sole purpose of diverting it out of state. We've also had 
all manner of international cartels move here, take over our gated communities, buy houses outright for cash, and set up mass grow operations in those homes. Humboldt County has some of the highest violent crime rates in, um, in California, and it has to do with organized crime. And this is the little, you know, the dark secret about marijuana. We've had East Coast crime families come in here. We've had Mexican mafia. We've had Asian gangs come in here, international gangs come here, buying property, leasing properties, and then growing marijuana so they can supply their suppliers on the East Coast, send it overseas. It's a huge deal. So people don't believe this myth that just because it's legalized that it's not going to become criminal anymore. We know the cartels are bringing in heroin. We have issues with human trafficking. We are supplying Mexican drug cartels with the best pot in the world. Pueblo wants to be known as the pot capital of the world and they seem to think that that's a really good idea. I don't. The cartels that are coming in are dangerous. We know somewhere this is going to turn into the, the little Laredo and if you've ever been down to Laredo it is a very scary place that you just don't stop. Well, it's terrifying, but it's, it's something we never had to deal with before. So it's new, uh, which is <laughs> hopefully a, um, will give some clue to some other states that are considering it that this is something you might have to look out for and it's something you're going to be welcoming into your state if you're not careful. What we're finding, unfortunately, is there is actually a very dark side to this industry that is uh, tainting our waters, our soil, poisoning our wildlife, deforesting our forest. It wasn't until we had our animals that we were monitoring dying and we basically did kind of like a reverse engineering, finding out where, what's going on and then boom, we found out that uh, marijuana cultivations in these public lands, our, our national treasures, were contaminating their wildlife. You have to bear in mind that the growers are there from April, May, June, July, August, September, October, an average of seven months. And an average of we're finding is about three to four growers per grow site because they're there the whole time. Now you take that site that's been there six, seven years, four people, seven months. And now you're looking at years of living in one area. And when that campsite gets full of excrement nearby and food and trash, they'll move another, to another campsite. But that stays in place. There has not been one trespass grow where I've seen people clean up after themselves. And that's not my personal opinion, that's our scientific data. Now the plot, you're in the forest and you have a lot of timber, big trees, but those big trees are gonna shade your marijuana plants. So what happens, deforestation. So cutting these trees down, opening it up, next to rivers and creeks. And so now you have a plant that is water thirsty. So now you have to irrigate it, which means dewatering creeks, pulling water away from salmon, pulling water away from cattle grazers out there and ranchers. About 50% of the waterways we've monitored have been positive for pesticide. When I say pesticides, it's a general category. When I say pesticides, I'm talking about fungicides, rodenticides, insecticides, molluscicides, herbicides, all of these different. These are all different layers all compiled in what I'm just giving you a general category. Because they're growing out in the hills that aren't designed you know, to be farms. And then as soon as it rains, it pushes all of that soil amendments, all that perlite, everything that's in those soils into the creeks, which goes in the streams, which goes into the rivers and push out to the ocean. They stay upwards of 13,000 unpermitted grows within the county of Humboldt alone. Even if we say only 10% of those have the same snapshot, that's still 1,000 plus grows that have that footprint within one county of over 50 counties in California. The days of going out on my federal public lands uh, alone are gone. I'm going to get in a world of trouble by running into an armed grower and getting killed out here. And that's what I decided not to take that risk. Our team now has to be accompanied by law enforcement to go in to go collect scientific data on our public lands. What I don't want to have happen is researchers and scientists that are going to say, we told you so. Money is money, but water and land and these species on this earth, they're unique. And if we blink them out, we can't recuperate from them sometimes, or it's going to cost us whatever dollar you gain, it's going to cost us tenfold more 
to regain for the loss of natural resources. Real estate prices are up, um, houses sell quickly, but yet there's no housing for those that can't afford it. So we're kind of gentrifying a little bit. A lot of the farm ground's being bought up, a lot of the housing's being bought up to grow the marijuana in. They're buying a bunch of houses, they're using the whole house to, for grows, then they're shipping that out of state. You have a bunch of parents growing inside their house, they can have unlimited dry product. From a, so from a law enforcement perspective, there's almost zero way to regulate it. And you can't regulate that. That's somebody's house. And so it becomes an issue. We only know about it when there's these huge busts with two, three hundred, four hundred plants. That actually then ruins the entire neighborhood. You now no longer have your kids out there playing in the street because you're worried about the clientele that's coming by. Well, our governor is always speaking out uh, about marijuana. He says, oh, it's a social experiment. He kind of chuckles and he never really comes out against it because when he was losing in the election, he had a huge fundraiser by the marijuana industry. He made millions of dollars. You can just Google it. Politicians willing to throw away lives for money. Literally, the youth, the citizens of Colorado and all the other legalized states are being experimented on. And Governor Hickenlooper will say, let the experiment continue. Our governor said it, it's a great social experiment. Um, an experiment put into play by people who didn't establish any guidelines for that experiment. When you experiment, you have criteria, you have guidelines, you have data, and you track the data to see if it's successful or not successful. And we continue to get from our governor's office, well, we can't tell you the cost, we don't know. We're figuring this out as we go, as people and their lives are really impacted by it. The studies are very clear. This experiment has not worked. The generation right now is the experiment. Marijuana is nothing more than tobacco 2.0. If you want to know what's going to happen with the marijuana industry in the United States, go back and look at tobacco at the turn of the century, from the turn of the century to the 80s. Almost no one smokes anymore because of the education that has come out. If we just had that before this happened. Do the research yourself. Don't trust me. Do the research yourself. Independent research, look at it. We can't just throw a bunch of volunteer people at a project and give them an hour a year or a semester and then say, well, that prevention failed. The biggest way to prevent is education. The numbers dropped and dropped and dropped in 20 years of prevention and now they're on the increase. Is that the direction that we want to go in? We lost the war on drugs, so let's legalize it. Well, we haven't lost the war on murder, right? We haven't eradicated murder, but it's still illegal. Right? Uh, that, that's just a silly argument. Um, yes, did, did we eradicate marijuana? No, absolutely not. But we did keep it to a maintenance level in a community. Uh, and, and that segued with our moral compass of society. And, and I think that's what nobody's talking about. When you normalize this type of behavior, you accept the byproducts of what happens. It will weaken our nation, weaken our workforce, weaken our students, our educational system, our ability to move forward and, and be on the world stage. Um, it's going to devastate our nation if we don't get this turned around very quickly. I speak out for two primary reasons. One is I just feel like there's a moral obligation and because most everyone else I know is, is afraid to do so. And so if all of us are quiet, what's going to happen. If we give up, we become complicit in this movement and just say, you know, mm, I'm going to look the other way or it's really okay with me. I, I won't be that person. Um, and so maybe there's one or two or five or ten of me against thousands, but you know what? The truth will bear out. I believe that. We are speaking out. It's very hard to continue to speak out when you're beat down by a group that has the money. We are the wild west of pot and there are a lot of unintended consequences that came along with legalization and so we are really a cautionary tale for others. A lot of homelessness, a lot of crime, and a lot of drug addicts who uh, prefer being high to life. It affects all of us. If it comes, then be prepared what comes with it. 